tonight. The mystery of flight MH370. Now the race against time to find the black box in the depths of the Indian Ocean. Breaking news from Malaysia and Perth. And we take you inside the world's worst airline tragedies, from the cockpits to the crash sites. The investigations that may help unravel this terrible tragedy. Good evening, everyone. I'm Peter Overton. The fearful families and a puzzled world have finally had to accept the sad reality that missing flight MH370 is at the bottom of the Indian Ocean and that no one survived. The confirmation came after painstaking examination of satellite clues. But the search for the crash site and the plane itself remain unresolved. Australia part of the international effort to pinpoint the wreckage, especially the flight recorders. They can hopefully answer the most critical questions. Why and how did this disaster occur? Tonight we're live across the region from Kuala Lumpur to RAF Base Pierce in Perth, Beijing and Melbourne. First of all, let's go to Kerry Yaxley in the Malaysian capital. And Kerry, authorities have just given a new briefing on the search. That's right, Pete. And the Malaysian Transport Minister has declared the Northern Search Corridor officially closed. He's also uh, said that the northern part of the Southern Corridor uh, near Indonesia is also closed. And that is because the search effort is increasingly focusing on the southern area of that corridor. Now, that search area is, has been reduced in size, but it is still enormous. It's still some 470,000 square miles. Uh, the Transport Minister also spoke at length about the... Uh, the, the data that prompted uh, the satellite data that prompted the Malaysian Prime Minister to declare that all hope uh, was lost for the plane. But Pete, he revealed that authorities still don't know the final location for MH370. Pete. Kerry, thank you for that. Reporting from Kuala Lumpur tonight. For the families, confirmation the plane had crashed was the last thing they ever wanted to hear. Damien Ryan reports on the day an agonising wait ended in heartbreaking certainty. Hand in hand and a nod between them, the son and a sister of Rod and Mary Burroughs bravely agree to share their grief. Our family is trying to come to terms with this terrible tragedy. We dearly love and we'll miss our mum and dad. The Brisbane grandparents were travelling with best friends Bob and Cathy Lawton. It was meant to be a dream holiday to China. We're heartbroken this stage of their life has been cut short. They worked hard to reap the rewards of their retirement so they could travel and spend time with friends and family. And after more than two weeks of torment, it was the ultimate tragic twist. The love and compassion that they shared and their priority of putting their family first will help us get through this together. We're grateful to all the organisations and countries providing the extensive search operations and our prayers and thoughts go out to all the families of the other passengers and crew on board the flight. A neighbour of the Lawton family was left searching for a positive. I suppose, uh, at least for the family, it's, you know, some, it's a dealing with one, one outcome as opposed to several possibilities that they were throwing out there. The pain was felt around the world. 239 people lost and our Prime Minister extended a nation's sympathy. I offer my condolences to the people of uh, all of the countries who have lost uh, friends, relatives, loved ones uh, in the MH370 tragedy. This has been a desperately difficult time. China has been hardest hit, 153 victims, and the reaction in Beijing was a mixture of distress <laughs> and anger. It was completely understandable. This woman lost three members of her family, her son, his wife and her grandchild. I beg you, she cries, it can't be like this. For some, the news they'd long dreaded had come via a text. Malaysian Airlines deeply regrets that we have to assume beyond any reasonable doubt that MH370 has been lost, it said. In Kuala Lumpur, it was left to the Malaysian Prime Minister to inform the rest of the world. Line MH370. 
370 ended in the southern Indian Ocean. But where it actually crashed and why still remains a mystery. One of Britain's most reputable newspapers, the Daily Telegraph, today claimed it was an apparent suicide mission. But Malaysian investigators insist the focus is moving towards mechanical failure or a fire on board. I don't want to speculate in terms of what happened to the aircraft. I think the investigation is ongoing. Okay, I think our focus is really for the family members. But the airline is in crisis. Will I resign? Calls for the CEO to be sacked are getting louder. And still so many questions about the hunt for the aircraft. Despite solid evidence the plane had turned hard left, the authorities continued to search in the wrong place for more than a week. For some of the grieving families, that is unforgivable. Damien Ryan, Nine News. Bad weather has caused a frustrating delay in the search operation today. All flights were cancelled and Navy ships turned around as conditions in the ocean took a turn for the worse. Senior reporter Simon Boder is at the Pierce Air Force Base tonight. Simon, a short break for the crews in what's been certainly a gruelling schedule. Absolutely, Pete. They must have taken advantage of today's rest, it, but it is going to be a short-lived rest. News tonight that the air search and the sea search will again continue tomorrow. In fact, it will grow. They're talking about 12 aircraft that will be in the skies tomorrow. They're talking about HMAS success will be going back into that search area, looking for those two objects that were sighted by a P3 Orion a couple of days ago. Hopefully, they're still in the area. So obviously there is a lot of focus going on to what will happen tomorrow. But today was a very, very different story. It was just simply too dangerous for the searchers to go out. Basically the planes had to be grounded. There was gale force winds. There were high seas. The swell was about four metres. The rain and visibility was down to zero out on the ocean itself. The conditions were basically horrendous. They're the front line of the search operation, but these planes are grounded, held up on the tarmac and unable to take off. Today, a rare chance to rest and a chance to assess the size of the task ahead. I want to take the opportunity to publicly thank uh, all of the crews and all of the teams that keep these planes flying. The operation here remains one of the largest ever of its kind. We're not searching for a needle in a haystack, we're still trying to define where the haystack is. The last few days of searching have been relentless, but the teams are now buoyed by a potentially positive sighting from an Australian Orion. Everyone is, is quite hyped. I think fatigue starting to set in for the guys. We were, uh, were going hammer and tongs there for, for three hours. Several items were spotted in the water. What they are isn't yet clear, but smoke beacons and GPS positioners have been dropped, marking the debris location. Oh, we haven't had this, uh, this level of activity for, the, um, yeah, for any of the flights. No, it's, uh, it's been the first time we've actually certified that we've seen something and got uh, photographs using our uh, camera operator up the front of anything in the area. HMAS success was dispatched to retrieve the objects, but bad weather meant it had to turn around. It's also hampered by the hazardous conditions, a Chinese icebreaker. It too is on standby to find and pick up any possible debris. The trouble is, the ocean currents are so strong, any delays could be critical. We are doing everything we can to, first of all, make a positive identification on a piece of debris. That will mean that we are on the right track. Now, that's not going to happen, I wouldn't think, for at least another 24 hours because we've had to redeploy our ship given the bad weather. Uh, as the Minister said, for safety concerns today, we had to pull the, uh, the assets off the, the search and put success to the south. But we're hoping for good weather in the, the coming days. There are two main currents battering the Southern Ocean. Both will drive and drift the debris across large areas. If the search can resume tomorrow, it will be helped by the arrival of the Japanese Disaster Relief Team. It's a specialist unit skilled in managing emergencies. Its members all experts at coordinating complex international affairs. Training which will no doubt be tested in this increasingly difficult operation. At RAAF Pierce, Simon Boda, Nine News. Finding the flight recorder is now a matter of urgency before it's lost forever beneath the waves. But finding it in the vast expanse of the Indian Ocean will take advanced equipment and an extraordinary degree of technical ingenuity. Our reporter Christina Hearn has more. 
An aircraft accident is never one thing. It may look like one thing, and it may be one primary thing, one proximate cause, but when you look at that, the investigator looks back and says, oh, well, that's because of this, that's because of that, that's because of that, and so that it's never one thing. As investigators begin trying to solve the mystery of what brought down Malaysian Flight 370, Thomas Anthony, an air crash investigator of over 20 years, says history shows it's usually a variety of factors that leads to disaster. Are the answers always in the debris as to what caused the aircraft to crash? Part of the answer mm -hmm. is in the debris, in the wreckage. It really depends on, on the wreckage itself. What increases investigators' chances of solving this puzzle is locating the aircraft's black box. In reality, it's two boxes normally painted orange, with one recording what's said in the cockpit, the other flight data. What the aircraft's doing in terms of pitch, roll um, and its attitude, what the engine thrust is doing, um, whether the seatbelt signs were on and off, what the temperatures were inside the, the, the cargo compartments, fire warnings, that kind of thing. Time is running out to unlock those secrets the black box may contain, with a battery-powered ping, they admit, lasting only 30 days following a crash. As the world is gripped with finding 370's black box, a demonstration of just what that ping sounds like. This is the pinger right here that has the battery and sends up the signal, and it's a, it's a kind of a metronome sound. Let's listen to it. And this is what these submersible crafts will be listening for. But there's a chance this isn't working. If the ping is not working, then the only way to find it is by sonar, looking for debris on the ocean floor and then sending a submarine down to pick it up, which is what happened in the Air France disaster. The black box finally recovered two years after the crash. And of course, even if it is found, there's no guarantee it will be in working order but they are designed to withstand immense pressure. They are required to, to sustain 3,400 G, which is equivalent to stopping a car from 70 miles an hour to zero miles an hour in one and a half centimetres. A submersible drone like this will be crucial in the hunt for the lost plane and its black box. The computer models that we have done shows that the debris has moved almost 500 kilometres away from where it would have originated from. But there is a warning. Even after the hunt for the wreckage is complete, the search for answers might go on for years to come. What about the black box? Would that not reveal something about the... It may not reveal anything about, about what happened uh, on, the, uh, on, on the flight deck. I mean, it will only reflect what happened with the airplane. And if there was no speaking, there would be nothing on the cockpit voice recorder. In the United States, Christina Hearn, Nine News. Well, this is the critical black box recorder, an Australian invention, and this is what searchers will be looking for over the next, you know, days, perhaps years, but they need to find it sooner rather than later. This is it, as I said, designed and uh, in Australia quite a few years ago now, but a critical piece of equipment usually stored in the tail of an aircraft because that, when there's an impact, usually is perhaps the, the part that survives survives the most. Well, the mystery of MH370 shows the conflict between the modern science of aviation and, of course, the raw power and isolation of the southern Indian Ocean. Neil Hansford is the Director of Strategic Aviation Solutions. He's worked in the aviation industry for 30 years, operating airlines in Australia, Asia, Europe and the Indian subcontinent. Thank you for joining us tonight, Neil. Thanks, Peter. And Eric Van Siebel is an ocean oceanographer with the University of New South Wales. He joins me as well. Thank you very much for coming in. First of all, Neil, do you think in your heart of hearts we'll ever, ever know what happened to MH370? If we don't get this black box in the time, I think it'll become a real mystery and the only place that'll be determined will be inquiries on the ground regarding the, the freight, the passengers, but more importantly, the crew. Have, how have the experts narrowed down this search area? We touched on it a little earlier, but this is sort of groundbreaking, not necessarily the technology they use, but the way they've used it. Yes, yeah, the combination of the technology they were using a simulation of a, a similar flight, which was MH377. They used that data and that allowed them to then use the Southern Corridor and using uh, Doppler technology, which had been first combined like this, they actually got it down to 3% of the Southern Corridor, down to an area they believe will be within 100 miles of where the crash site was. So basically we're looking, you know, when, it, when we nail it all down, a, a circle of 100 miles, 
That's that, where they've really got to scour. That's where they've got to scour, but they'll be using uh, the satellite pictures we've got from the Australian, Chinese and from the French, which are all taken at different times, and then the effects of the ocean will determine the backtracking to where it's likely to have entered the water. Well, that's where I'll bring Eric in, the effects yeah. of the ocean. What knowledge do you have about the great Indian Ocean? And, and it's so remote. You know, you're looking at currents, you're looking at depth, you're looking at winds. What do you know? Well, it is indeed a very dynamic region. This part of the ocean is home to the strongest current in the world. It's called the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, and it just flows around and around and around the Antarctic continent. And it transports masses and masses of water. But it doesn't do that in like one giant current. It actually fluctuates all the time. So it goes back and forth. And on top of that, it's filled with what we call eddies. And eddies, in essence, are small hurricanes. They're, they're vortices that sit on top of these current and move everything and stir the entire thing up. So if you've got debris down there, that can be lifting large 24 metre sections of fuselage or wing, things like that? Well, probably not when it is at the bottom. If it's at the bottom, probably it will stay there. But how it went from the surface to the bottom, or how everything that's still on the surface, how that moves, that's a very, very complex problem to solve. Neil, what do you reckon? What's your theory on what's happened to this plane? I think the payment, from the first day I said it was either a catastrophic explosion, which it hasn't been because it flew for so long, it was struck by military ordnance or a military aircraft, which doesn't appear to be, or it was a malfeasance of uh, one of the crew, and uh, I d I, my view hasn't changed, and more and more people are coming to the view that I held uh, on the 8th of March. That it was a suicide, pilot suicide. Exactly, pilot suicide, and the motive hasn't even, uh, is not even been looked at yet, but um, this has brought great discredit on the country of Malaysia and Malaysian Airlines, and maybe that was the motive. OK. Neil, Eric, thank you very much for coming in tonight. And giving us your thoughts on, on what's happening in the oceans and, of course, from a uh, pilot and uh, aviation expert's perspective. Thank you. Pleasure. OK. Still to come in this special edition of Nine News, from Australia to Beijing, how the grieving families will cope with what they face next. And lessons from the past, the similarities between the Malaysia crash and the world's worst air disaster. This crash was going to happen one day, one flight, just a matter of which one. Welcome back. In piecing together what happened on board flight MH370, investigators are likely to look to lessons from the past. History is littered with airborne crashes. Determining what went wrong is crucial to helping grieving families recover and helping air safety experts try and prevent repeat tragedies. Nine Tower Gips has assessed chilling documentaries taking us inside the cockpits of the world's worst air disasters one of which has simil similarities with MH370. It was involved in a previous structural incident and veered dramatically off course. Trying to discover why planes crash can take months, even years. It's a puzzle of immense complexity. But as you'll see, when investigators finally get to the truth, the cause can be quite simple. As with JAL Flight 123, a jumbo jet disaster that has a few similarities with the little we do know about the Malaysian Airlines flight. 6.12 p.m. The takeoff of Flight 123 is captured by an amateur photographer. The plane left its stand a little bit behind schedule and was going to then pick up a southwesterly route going towards Osaka. As the plane climbs towards its cruising altitude, the passengers settle into the journey. About 12 minutes into the flight, there was an explosion. There's a sudden decompression in the cabin as air is sucked out, but nobody can tell where the plane has blown open. Something exploded! There's no knowledge of what this explosion actually was. There's no rear view mirror or anything like that on an aeroplane, so they couldn't actually see what was going on. Tokyo, Japan an emergency landing is arranged with Tokyo Airport, but getting the plane down is going to be a problem. 
Cover it. We'll be covered. Whatever's caused the explosion has damaged the plane's hydraulic controls. Steering the aircraft is becoming impossible. Imagine trying to drive a car and your pedals are now frozen. You can't actually do anything with your gas, brakes, clutch, anything like that. Flight 123 is now dangerously unstable. The plane starts rolling from side to side in a snaking uh, pattern. The passengers on board are given a nightmarish ride. Nine-year-old Ken Miyajima and the others on board are now 24,000 feet in the air on a crippled plane. 524 lives are now hanging by a thread. But despite the terror in the cabin, an eerie silence has descended on the cockpit. There's a disturbing lack of interest from the captain. For some minutes now, the crew have been breathing the air at over 20,000 feet without putting on their oxygen masks. It's possible that the captain is now suffering from oxygen deprivation, hypoxia. This can lead to a situation ranging from feeling slightly drunk to being unconscious right the way through to fatality. It's not long before the other pilots seem to be affected as well. It is thought that basically they were losing some of their functions. They were not able to speak. Japan 123, if you read me, identify, please. Identify, please. Flight 123 gives no response to air traffic control in Tokyo. Instead, the crippled plane with its paralyzed pilots begins to meander towards forested mountains. Impressively, they devise a way to maneuver it by using the engines. If they increase the power on the left engines, they can turn slowly to the right. And if they increase the power on the right engines, they can turn slowly to the left. It's an immensely difficult balancing act, but it gives them some hope of clearing the mountains. Power. Efforts prove futile. The engines get out of sync, and the plane begins to plummet towards the forests below. Japan Airlines Flight 123 crashes into remote mountains 60 miles northwest of Tokyo. Over 500 people have perished. The key to finding out what really happened is often those data recorders, the so-called black boxes which investigators make a search priority. Now, the Malaysian Airlines wreckage could be deep in the ocean, but with the JAL flight, which crashed on a mountain, their recovery was relatively easy. Investigators recover the precious flight data recorders from the wreckage. The cockpit voice recording provides an interesting clue. Listen right now. Right door has broken. The initial attention turns to one of the doors on the plane. During the final 32 minutes, there is communication that there is damage to the rear right-hand door in the cabin area. Investigators know from the voice recording that the pilots faced problems with the plane's controls and that the right rear door failed. With no other leads to follow, they suspect that the door blew off during the flight and damaged flying controls in the tail fin. So naturally, attention turns to, can we find this part of the plane? Since the plane traveled for another 30 minutes beyond where the controls were lost, then if the cause was the door blowing off, it should be found miles from the crash site. But it isn't. It's found with the main body of the plane with no sign that it blew off. There's no indication that any of the damage to the door would have happened prior to the crash itself. So, of course, immediately that means they need to find something else. They're back to square one. But they don't have to wait long. A piece of the plane's wreckage is found floating in a bay 
off the coast of Japan, and it's part of the vertical stabiliser, the tail fin. The tail fin is found in Sugami Bay, an area directly below the flight path of the ill-fated plane, right where it suffered the explosion. Investigators now have strong evidence that the tail fin came off during the explosion. Their suspicions are soon confirmed. An eyewitness photograph of Flight 123 is given to investigators. Taken only moments before the crash, it's a striking image. It's no ordinary looking plane. An analysis was done on it and was found that over 50% of the vertical stabilizer was missing. The tail fin is an absolutely fundamental structure on a plane. How could it just blow off? Investigators take a closer look at the history of the aircraft itself. Was there a clue from its service records? They start looking into the history of this plane, seeing if there's anything particularly unique about this plane. And it's found that this plane was involved in a previous accident in 1978. It's a major discovery. Seven years earlier, the same Boeing 747 had been involved in a different accident. As the plane came into land from a routine flight, the tail hit the runway, damaging the rear pressure bulkhead. This is the airtight partition at the back of the tail, designed to prevent pressurized air in the cabin from escaping. The bulkhead was so badly damaged, it had to be patched up by engineers. But investigators find something very disturbing. When the log is looked at, they see that the repair is not done in the way it was supposed to have been done. To do the repair job correctly, the maintenance team was required to splice a patch called a doubler plate in between the damaged sections of the bulkhead and secure it with three rows of rivets. But that's not what they did. Instead, they used two separate plates, securing the bottom one with two rows of rivets and the top with just one. It was a critical maintenance error. This weakens the joint, and it's estimated that it probably weakened it by around about 30%. With every takeoff and landing on all flights, the cabin pressurizes and depressurizes causing imperceptible flexing of the fuselage. If the joints holding it together aren't secured strongly enough, this flexing can cause fatigue cracks to develop. Eventually, one final pressurization is too much, and the joint fails altogether. It meant that this crash was going to happen one day, one flight, it just a matter of which one. A basic maintenance error caused the worst single aircraft disaster in history. Still to come in this nine news special, we're in Beijing where grieving families have turned to anger. Who do they blame? Also the technical fault that for six years dogged the most widely used jetliner in the world. And see what happens when all systems fail on the world's first super jumbo, the Airbus A380. Welcome back. Well, the majority of the passengers on board MH370 were from China and there have been angry clashes in Beijing with distraught relatives accusing the Malaysian government of murdering their families. Sky News reporter Jonathan Samuels sent this report from Beijing. We saw such distressing scenes at the hotel here last night, but today we've seen many of the family members turning their grief into action, at least for now. Uh, they tried to get on buses at the hotel here in order to go down to the Malaysian embassy to protest. There were quite angry scenes as the police prevented them from getting on those buses. There were some scuffles and in the end the relatives decided to march and they walked three miles down the road. They were holding banners saying things like 
Uh, the Malaysian government are murderers. Uh, we want our relatives back. And when they arrived at the embassy, they were standing outside, surrounded by riot police. It was largely peaceful. Uh, the media were kept well aware, again behind another police line. And at one stage, some relatives tried to get members of the media to join them. Uh, we were stopped. There was a, a bit of a scuffle. One lady ended up uh, on the floor. She had to be taken to hospital. And then, after a couple of hours, all the relatives went back onto the buses and are now back here at the hotel. It was quite extraordinary, extraordinary, because demonstrations like this simply aren't allowed in China. They were remarkable scenes. And what we're being told is happening at the moment is that the a Malaysian ambassador to China is due to meet the relatives uh, and have another meeting with them uh, in the next few hours. Thank you, Jonathan. We're joined now by psychologist Sandy Ray from Melbourne. Sandy, good evening to you. Good evening, Peter. The reaction over the last few weeks since this tragedy unfolded from not only relatives of the Chinese but others, it's been um, quite extraordinary. The reaction today with the news that perhaps that, you know, the, the, the Malaysian government has said the plane has crashed and we regret but there'll be no survivors. Why are they, go why are they reacting so strongly, do you think? Well, what's happened in this last two weeks, they've been experiencing what's called unresolved loss. And that means that these families have been effectively stuck in time. They haven't been able to know where their bodies are. They've been having probably very real images of what's happened to... How did our family members die? Was there an explosion? Have they been pirated away? Are they still alive? So they've just been wondering what on earth has been going on. And now that unresolved loss is final. It's now what we call resolve loss. They know what has happened to their family members. There's no ambiguity. And so now all this anger about the allegations of withholding information, the distress, the denials, the, the intellectualisation of what's gone on has come to a head. And now the families have to deal with their very real grief and bereavement. And how do you manage this as a psychologist? You've got all these people who are just so, so grief-stricken. Mm. What do you do? How professionally can you help them take steps forward? Look, well, there is no mandate of this is the solution is how we handle grief. In the olden days, we used to think of grief going in, in a lockstep fashion. But now we understand grief is going in waves and cycles. So, you know, sometimes people will be managing very well and then all of a sudden they'll get a trigger and they'll plummet down to real sadness and memories of the person that has died. And typically, you know, it depends on the circumstances of the death, of which we now know. It depends on the personality of the, the individual family members, how they react to grief. And depends on the resources around them, that the, the sense of family they've got, the connectedness to their family and who, they, who else they can talk to and share their experiences with. And I think it's impacted not only on the families but people who've... It's gripped the world, this story. I was talking to someone at the kids' local school this morning and she was telling me how sad she felt just observing this. Mm. And it's very much like 9-11. You know, there's this whole whole world media attention on it because, of course, there were many image, there were many sort of possibilities. Was it was the plane diverted to some rare, uh, country location? You know, was it pilot suicide? Are the people possibly alive and floating in the ocean? And I think that's been part of the the interest, particularly, and of course, desperately needing to find some sense of resolution. Why, where are our family members? All right, Sandy Ray, thank you very much for joining us on this Nine News special. Thanks, Peter. Still to come tonight, the terrifying moment computer systems failed on a Qantas A380. One of the many great unknowns of flight MH370 is what caused it to veer so far off its flight plan. A lot will hinge on what can be gained from its computer records if and when the flight's black box is found. Tonight we take you inside a Qantas A380 Airbus and relive how a flight crew managed to save hundreds of people after that aircraft's computer system failed. Slats failed, left aerials failed. The latest aircraft are so full of computers they can virtually fly themselves, but that can be a two edged sword. What if those complex systems fail, as they did with the Qantas A380 state of the art mega jumbo three and a half years ago? When pilots put all their trust in those systems, will they cope when they fail? Qantas Flight 32 lifts off from Changi Airport just before 10 a.m. Five minutes later, 
as it reaches 7,000 feet. There were two loud noises. It was like boom, boom. Captain de Crepigny's first reaction is to reduce power. I immediately went to level the aircraft, which would serve to bring the thrust off the engines and to make everything less severe. At the same time, the plane's computer system is telling them number two engine is on fire. De Crepigny tries to set off its remote-controlled fire extinguishers, but gets no response. Then, number two engine cuts out completely. Engine two, fail. Losing one engine out of four is a problem, but it shouldn't be a catastrophe. The plane's computerized flying system is programmed to manage just such a situation. But single engine failure suddenly turns into something much worse. Wing slats fail, left arrows fail. In just one minute, the system's reporting a cascade of over 50 different error messages. Fuel system and flight controls. Hydraulics and low pressure. Landing gear, brakes, air conditioning. And now the problem with number two engines starts spreading. Engines one and four are still working, but the computer system is warning the pilots it can no longer fully control them. It's becoming clear the explosion has caused a massive failure of the computerized flying system. 469 lives now hang in the balance. Because when a plane loses its onboard computer system, it can become unflyable. The crew now realize the all powerful computer system can no longer control the plane. I had my thumb up most of the time, just cancelling the bells. You can't think with a bell ringing out on top of your head. Crews struggle to understand what's going on. None of them have trained for total systems failure. Captain de Crepigny realizes he has to get the plane down on the ground as quickly as possible. The pilots agree their best hope is to head back to Singapore's Changi Airport. But they're flying the world's biggest plane. It's badly damaged and still full of fuel. That means they'll have to land fast and overweight. The danger is they'll go off the runway. At just 500 feet, the stall warning goes off. They're flying too slow. But it's too late to pull out. So I pushed up the number three thrust lever and the stall warning went away. But their speed is still a problem. Just didn't seem as if we were slowing down. We were just going such a high speed the whole time. With the automatic brakes not working, De Crepigny resorts to brute force. The auto brake system had malfunctioned, so he had his feet on the brakes, manually braking the aeroplane. So I said, brakes. Right. And he said, I am, and I said, no, get into it. finally come to a halt, just 100 metres from the end of the runway. After losing most of its onboard computer systems, it's taken all the crew's skill and experience to get it back on the ground safely. A very famous story, an extraordinary story on the great skill of those Qantas pilots. Still to come on this Nine News special, the bizarre and deadly technical fault that for years dogged the widely used jetliner, the most widely used jetliner in the world, and how investigators cracked the mystery.
From the moment an airliner starts trundling down the runway, the lives of the passengers are in someone else's hands. And not just the pilots and maintenance crews, but the designers and engineers as well. A fatal flaw in the rudder mechanism of the Boeing 737 baffled experts for six years. It was the longest investigation in US aviation history. What was causing the most popular small airliner in the world to crash on final approach? Then, finally after six years, the breakthrough that may have saved many, many lives. Richmond Airport, Virginia. A Boeing 737 is preparing to land. Hold up. Suddenly. It rolls out of control. It's the third freak accident involving a 737. Hold up. Hold up. It will turn into the greatest detective story in aviation history. Why would the Boeing 737, the most widely used jetliner, just fall out of the sky? Trenton, June the 9th, 1996, 7 p.m. The crew are due to fly to Richmond, Virginia. As evening falls, the plane climbs into the sky, just like thousands of 737s every day. Then, after 87 minutes, they're approaching their destination in Richmond. Then, the plane hits air turbulence. Captain Bishop touches the rudder controls to line up the aircraft for landing. He expects the plane to turn slightly to the right. But that's not what happens. It's on the point of flipping over. The plane is out of control and turning catastrophically towards the ground. What he doesn't know is that this is a problem that's happened before in a 737. Five years earlier, United Flight 585 is about to set off on a short hop from Denver to Colorado Springs. After just 20 minutes, the Boeing 737 starts its final approach. Without warning, the airplane begins to roll. The plane careens savagely to the right. Everyone on board is killed instantly. The crash of Flight 585 remains a mystery. September the 8th, 1994. There are 127 passengers. US Air Flight 427 is another 737. As the aircraft approaches Pittsburgh, air traffic control tells it to join a queue of planes waiting to land. There are two big bumps in quick succession. The airplane starts to roll. No, no survivors. survivors. No survivors, that's right. Accident investigator Malcolm Brenner gets the call. Straight away, he starts seeing parallels with earlier accidents. Last moments aren't just similar, they're identical. Flight 427's black box shows exactly what every single control on the aircraft is doing at the fatal moment. The rudder on flight 427 is jammed hard to the right, as far as it can go. They now have a theory for the accident, but no solid proof. Two years later, over the skies of Richmond, Virginia, Eastwind Airways flight 517 seems to have encountered the same problem again. Another 737 is rolling wildly out of control. Then the controls suddenly unlock again. The plane levels out. It's the second time the rudder controls have locked and released in almost as many seconds. Minutes later, Flight 517 touches down safely in Richmond, Virginia. The 
emergency landing of Flight 517 raises one immediate question. Why has it survived when early... Welcome back to this Nine News special on the MH370 mystery. It's been a day that was a major but also distressing turning point in the search for answers to the mystery of the flight. The Malaysian government confirmed their fears that the aircraft had crashed into the southern Indian Ocean. The crucial evidence came after groundbreaking detective work from British satellite experts tracking the likely eventual path taken by the jetliner. That final confirmation devastating. Relatives of the missing passengers and crew distraught, forced to give up any lingering hope. Shocking weather in the search zone today kept the multinational force of aircraft grounded. Ships were forced to steer clear because of very rough seas. However, the weather is expected to improve dramatically overnight and a dozen search planes are back in the air early tomorrow, trying to locate debris that has been spotted over the past few days. As well, the United States is dispatching their underwater search drones, hoping to find the planes flight recorders. And that is our Nine News special on flight MH370. I'm Peter Overton. From all of us here in the Nine Newsroom, a very good night.